Started. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the latest Duke media briefing on the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Gregory Phillips with Duke Communications. COVID-19 cases in the US are at record levels and still rising, but it's not clear how or even if the Trump administration plans to respond before leaving office. With me today to discuss what steps society needs to take to slow the continued spread of the pandemic is Dr. Mark McClellan. He is a physician and economist who directs the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, where he works on strategies and policy reforms to improve health care. He was previously commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Dr. McClellan, good morning. Hey, Greg. Good to be back with you all. Thank you. Um, given we're not seeing any messaging from the White House right now on the worsening case numbers, uh, what can and should states and local governments be doing right now to slow the spread in these, these alarming numbers that we're having? Well, there are some messages coming from the Department of Health and Human Services, including the Secretary of HHS, other senior political appointees, as well as the uh, career staff leaders there like Tony Fauci, which is uh, first and foremost, um, the um, uh, please try to follow the guidance that we know works. Um, people are, are uh, very frustrated, tired of, uh, uh, exhausted by the pandemic at this point. But um, Greg, we always knew that this was going to be the toughest part, you know, heading into winter, colder weather, people closer together, uh, and um, some travel events, other events, uh, rallies, all, all that have contributed to, um, uh, to, to spread of the virus over the last few weeks. And we are um, not in control uh, in uh, any part of the country. And in contrast to the previous two surges that we've seen with uh, COVID, the uh, one in April and the one in the summer, this one truly is nationwide. It's every single part of the country. Um, it's uh, affecting different areas uh, differently. Some areas like uh, uh, El Paso, Texas, um, um, South Dakota, North Dakota, much of the Mountain West, uh, uh, very rapid growth with uh, healthcare systems that are at capacity or beyond with uh, uh, really getting to the point where people who are sick, uh, maybe uh, having maybe may have difficulty um, getting them the, the the services that they need. And um, as uh, I, I've talked about before, other public health experts have, um, that's the time or, or maybe even past the time when it's important to not only continue to encourage uh, masks and distancing uh, for individuals, both when they go out and when they're in events and, and possible gatherings at home, uh, but also to take some further steps um, from a, a state, local and, and um perhaps federal standpoint to, uh, to encourage more use of the steps that we know work. Um, President-elect Biden has talked about uh, something like a, a national mask mandate. There's some limits on his authorities uh, to, to do that um, in areas that are under state and local jurisdiction. Uh, but I do think it's time for every state and every mayor to be thinking about whether they've reached a level of um, lack of containment in their community that they need to, to pull back. And we've seen that uh, restrictions on um, bars, nightclubs, uh, restaurants, maybe not complete closures, but certainly less density uh, and more outdoor activities, hard in the winter, but, but less density, more outdoor activities, uh, does lead to a significant reduction in local spread with so much of the spread happening uh, in communities. Um, so restrictions on gatherings um, could be um, uh, a good alternative if done early enough to uh, complete lockdowns. And in many parts of Europe, and even in some parts of the United States, we're starting to see something that looks much more like uh, uh, the, the broad shutdowns back in the spring. And the way to avoid that uh, is to individually take the steps that we know work, which I know is hard uh, for people right now, uh, limit um, uh, interaction with groups, including over Thanksgiving uh, coming up and uh, the other holidays coming up until we're, we're past this uh, and uh, back that up with some, uh, some state, local and, and, and federal government support. Um, uh, we're, we're definitely trending in the wrong direction right now though. Absolutely, thank you for that. And before we open up to questions, I wanted to follow up on a point you just made about Thanksgiving and Christmas. How concerned are you that um, whatever state, federal, local governments do in terms of mandates um, about masking or, or distancing, people on an individual basis are gonna be making decisions to travel or host people at Thanksgiving and then at Christmas, and that that could essentially um, negate any of the decisions that are made at the government level. I mean, could you reinforce yeah. whether you think that is a real, real risk um, to worsening the pandemic right now? 
Well, a lot of people do want to see family members and friends. They've spent this much, most of this year um, more isolated and away from them. These are these are big traditional events. Um, you know, I, I think many of us, um, me too, I'd love to see my mother. If she's older, she has some health issues, not going to be able to do it in person this Thanksgiving. We're going to have to to try out the uh, the Zoom approach. Um, so I, I do think people should really consider um, what's best for their loved ones, especially if they're in a higher risk category or um, if they live with or interact with uh, people who, who are. Um, this is how spread occurs and it occurs even though most of the cases now are in relatively younger people, 20, 30s, uh, who don't uh, generally have much symptoms, uh, they do pass along to others that they come in close contact with uh, who are uh, more likely to be hospitalized, not to mention that we've seen hospitalizations and, and deaths in, in younger individuals too. Uh, if you are going to travel, the CDC has some suggestions for you. It includes um, uh, travel and be close to others that you're not normally in your in your bubble uh, with you. First of all, just be careful about expanding your bubble. The bigger it gets, the more likely it is to burst. Um, if you are going to be spending time with people who you haven't been uh, in isolation uh, with, um, it suggests some quarantine time ahead. You know, the, the standard guidance is two weeks. Uh, I know some people are maybe doing a little bit less, like a week of isolation um, before they uh, go to meet others and then doing getting some tests. You know, it's easier to get tested for COVID than it, than it used to be. Just because you have a negative test today doesn't mean you're not uh, already infected and couldn't be infectious uh, tomorrow. So one test uh, doesn't do it. It's not a replacement for, for isolation and being very careful. And if you are really going to get together, um, uh, the more you can stay isolated and, and uh, follow the measures of masks and, and distancing and, and frequent hand washing, the better. But this is just not really a Unfortunately, it's just a, it's just a bad year for for getting together in um, in, in groups over over Thanksgiving and and probably over the end of year holidays as well. I think the good news, Greg, is that this is probably uh, the last big surge of this whole acute phase of the COVID-19 pandemic, as I think we're going to talk about. There's been uh, um, remarkable progress on vaccines. Um, those aren't going to really start kicking in in terms of reducing risk for, for all of us for, for a few more months, but it's not that far away. Uh, we also have some, some treatments that help if we can figure out how to get them out to the people who need them most. Um, I'm talking about some thing, treatments like man-made uh, antibodies that you know seem to work uh, as as well as some of these new vaccines do that can be um, infused uh, for people who are high risk and have been uh, exposed uh, to the virus and are coming down with symptoms. Uh, we haven't yet worked out how to get those out to the to the public though. Um, but all that means that, that the months ahead are going to look better uh, than the weeks ahead. Um, so if we can really double down and uh, and try to contain this this huge outbreak. Um, uh, I don't think uh, this is going to go on for uh, things are going to start gradually getting better. Um, uh, won't be at um, broad immunity, won't be past this for uh, still months to come, but it will start getting better by early 2021. Thank you, Dr. McClellan. And it's certainly good to hear a shred of good news um, right now. Uh, we'll open up to questions. Um, thanks to everybody who already sent questions. Um, as a reminder, those of you joining us on Zoom can submit questions via the Q&A window at the bottom right hand of your Zoom screen. You can also ask questions in person by raising your hand. And if you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and we'll unmute you so you can ask your question. We've had some come in and, and Dr. McClellan, you mentioned about the vaccines. And um, one of the questions we've had here is under the best case scenario in which Pfizer and Moderna's vaccine candidates are authorized, or are, are authorized. When's the earliest that most Americans could expect to get vaccinated? Do you think? Well, we're probably not going to have most Americans vaccinated till late later on in the second quarter or second half of, uh, uh, of 2021. Remember that the vaccines that are going to be available if things stay on track, um, as 
uh, the, the Operation Warp Speed leaders have been recently saying uh, vaccines will start to be available later in December. That's going to be under a special distribution approach for the very highest risk groups, healthcare workers and uh, people in nursing homes or in settings where they're at high risk because they're older uh, or have uh, other conditions and, they're, and they have to be uh, together with others. Um, so that's the first round, probably the first month or two is really focusing on the those high risk essential workers with a limited supply of maybe two vaccines. Again, if uh, the, the rest of the uh, development and approval process goes smoothly, and then probably not broader access for, you know, for, for most Americans who are higher risk, meaning um, over 60, 65, or with a, a, a chronic condition or who are obese. And that, that's a lot of Americans. That's, you know, half or, half or more probably of, uh, of, of Americans will probably start to get access around um, uh, later January, February, maybe. Um, we may have a couple more vaccines available by the second quarter, so that could uh, increase uh, availability even more, um, but probably not till later uh, in the first half or the, the, the second half of the year that, that most Americans will have been vaccinated. Remember that as part of this too, um, we're, we're not including kids. Uh, so um, uh, especially younger kids are not part of any of the uh, vaccination testing going on now or uh, any part of the uh, vaccination plan. So it's gonna be a while before most Americans are, are vaccinated. Sure, thank you. And you mentioned the development and approval process. I'd like to dig into that a little bit more because obviously everybody's paying much closer attention to this than they would uh, um, in previous years. So what should we be looking for next? We've had these encouraging results from Pfizer and Moderna, but of course there are more hoops to go through. So, so what, we sh what should we expect the next few weeks to look like in terms of public announcements about vaccine development? So very promising announcements. Uh, this is way better evidence on the efficacy of the vaccine, its ability to prevent um, significant infections as, and as well as serious infections, uh, hospitalizations, uh, better than just about everybody uh, expected. So next step is the vaccine manufacturers are gathering some additional data, not just on efficacy, but on safety. Remember FDA required collection of data for at least a couple of months on most of the people in the study after they had finished getting vaccinated uh, to see if there were any rare but important side effects that have occurred. And we haven't seen all of that data yet from the reports from the companies. It seems like there are side effects and you always expect side effects from vaccines, things like uh, sore arms, achiness, um, uh, feeling tired, maybe some other symptoms. Uh, but from what's been reported so far, those do happen. They seem to happen at a higher rate than for a typical flu vaccine, but that probably is an indicator that this is a really potent vaccine that's, that's inducing your, uh, your, your body to, to, to react. Um, which could be a good sign, but not any indications of very serious side effects, even in the, uh, the, the thousands of patients who have now been followed for some time. And most vaccine side effects, the serious ones occur in the first uh, couple of months. So the companies have to put together all that data on efficacy, as well as on safety across the whole big study, turn that into FDA in writing. They've had some ongoing discussions with the whole package for a emergency uh, use authorization needs to come together. FDA is then going to review that. They're going to do it pretty quickly because they've already been looking at a lot of the data and they're going to write up their summary and their review and their impressions. And they're going to share it with an independent uh, review group, an advisory committee to the FDA that's already met once and that's going to provide their opinions on whether the vaccines meet a standard for emergency use authorization and any views about in which patients or additional steps that should get uh, attention as, as FDA moves forward. If that goes smoothly, my guess is that FDA will then move pretty quickly. It's a matter of uh, days to a week or something uh, to uh, reach a decision about approval. After that, um, I expect availability would happen pretty soon. There's still one more independent review. That's from the Centers for Disease Control and their Independent Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which will really focus on which people should get the vaccines first and next and uh, prioritization issues based on what the exact evidence shows. So they'll be looking at things like, uh, did the vaccine work as well in older individuals uh, or in individuals with serious health problems as an 
in um, younger and healthier individuals. And by the way, the data so far, again, preliminary, looks like it does, um, but, but, but we'll see. Um, so all that needs to be reviewed. That can all happen though, Greg, in, in a matter of a, a month is what um, our, uh, the, the warp speed leaders are, are estimating. And so that could mean approval starting on a limited basis through special distribution channels uh, by the second half of, um, of December. So just a, month, uh, just a month from now. Sure, thank you. Got a couple more questions on vaccines before we move on. One is that, um, are you concerned because the, the, obviously these, these trials, because they've taken place in a short period of time, can't guarantee that the vaccines provide long lasting um, resistance to COVID? Are there, is there a gap there in knowledge? Could we, should we be concerned or worried that uh, getting a vaccine now won't necessarily mean you're protected a few months away? Uh, there is a gap in knowledge. It does look like the protection is going to last at least a few months. So I, I don't think people should worry if these vaccines get authorized and they take them, that it's only going to protect them for a week or a very short period of time. Uh, they're very, very likely to protect people um, for at least um, this acute phase of the, uh, of the pandemic, which means months uh, at least. Um, it doesn't mean they're perfect, you know, 90, 95% is good, but that does mean some infections uh, may get through. Um, and it doesn't mean that everybody's not gonna have symptoms, you know, they may have milder symptoms, but it, I do think they can be confident that they'll have protection for months. What we don't know really, Greg, is will the immunity last substantially longer than say the next season, the next six months to a year? Will people need to get uh, COVID booster shots uh, every year or maybe um, uh, every five years? And um, there's some reasons to think that it could be longer than a year. We've had some experience with other coronaviruses that suggest that may be the case, but, but, but we just don't know. And we'll learn that based on the experience that people have, the people in the clinical trials and, and now uh, um, uh, probably soon a lot more of us um, as uh, uh, we see what happens in the time after uh, people get, um, get, get vaccinated. Uh, uh, but it's, I think it's, it's, it's very plausible that we may need um, booster shots, not, not in a matter uh, of a few months, but in annually, every few years, something like that. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes here and we're going to get through as many questions as we can. One more question on vaccination and treatments. Um, we have a reporter asking if you've been following the emergency youth authorization for monoclonal antibodies from Eli Lilly and whether patients and the general public should view this as potentially providing a significant help in preventing crowding at hospitals or does that overstate the potential impact? No, I think it's a, a very promising treatment. And this is um, not based on a weak study, but based on randomized clinical trials for people, especially those who are at risk of going on to have serious complications from COVID. Uh, people who are older in risk groups who uh, started having symptoms that, that were getting worse. Um, the, these uh, monoclonal antibodies, which are basically man-made versions of the kinds of antibodies that we're trying to create through the vaccines, um, they do uh, have a significant effect on neutralizing uh, the virus for people who are treated early and preventing them from uh, having uh, serious complications and, and hospitalizations. The challenge now is really getting those monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies out to the patients who can benefit. We are not well set up in our healthcare system to do that. Remember through this whole pandemic, what we've been telling people is to um, get tested if they have symptoms, and then if they test positive, to stay home, to stay away uh, from healthcare until they get really sick um, so that they won't spread the virus. And that's because we didn't have any good treatments uh, for people at that stage. Well, we do now, but this is a special treatment. It needs to be infused. Uh, it takes an, an hour. It's a monoclonal antibody. This is not... Um, just a shot in the arm. So uh, we're going to need to set up approaches in our healthcare systems and also for our high risk populations, people in nursing homes and, and others who may not be able to uh, easily travel, uh, set up special um, uh, COVID uh, infusion sites. You can't put patients who are getting infused for uh, COVID who are actively infectious in the same place as say a cancer patient or, or other people who benefit from monoclonal antibody infusions. Got to be a separate approach. 
and also need to work out how to do home or, or community-based versions, you know, getting these uh, infusion treatments via specially trained nurses and supporting personnel who can handle any complications that occur uh, out to the at-risk patients who are infected, um, but who can't travel uh, so easily. Uh, and this all has to be done pretty quickly. We know that these treatments become less effective the more, uh, the later you get in your course and the more serious you get. And they actually may be harmful for people who have already been, um, already progressed to the point where they're in the hospital. So um, this is something that has not been worked out. Um, our center released a, a paper on this um, uh, today, uh, or is releasing one today. It encourage people to take a look at it. It lays out the, uh, the issues and challenges around payment for administering these treatments, around setting up these special facilities. And uh, uh, if we are successful, I, I do worry. We've got so many COVID patients in the U.S. now. I do worry about the, the supply we have. But right now, we're, we're not there yet on taking advantage of this, um, uh, of this treatment. And, and again, just to look ahead for the next few months, if we can get through the, uh, the coming weeks, um, we have um, uh, vaccines over the coming months that are going to gradually help um, prevent infection spread and, and uh, reduce the, the likelihood of these spikes. We have a lot more available of availability of rapid testing that are being used by um, university, sports league, Saturday Night Live, uh, other um, workplaces where people have to be together, those could be more widely available and help detect outbreaks early and contain them, uh, help us reopen schools and, and uh, keep uh, people safe in uh, many more essential workplaces and, and prevent further spread. Combine that with availability of these antibody treatments so that people who are infected don't have a serious consequences. 2021 can look a lot different uh, than right now in terms of the impact of COVID, uh, but we do have some some important further work to do to get there. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, we've got about five minutes left and we've got several questions. So I'm going to ask you uh, for some quick uh, qu kind of quick fire answers to as many of these we can get through. Uh, one um, asks, it says you and several other former FDA commissioners have previously called for the FDA to be an independent agency. Do you think the COVID-19 response and the concerns about political interference will revive those calls? And is it something a Biden administration should consider once it's in office? I think it's something that the new administration should consider. You know, we're going to have a deep look at, at um, everything that could have been done better. In, in dealing with this pandemic as we uh, start to get through it more. So that's going to be a, a, should be a big focus area for Congress and, uh, and, and the administration in 2021. Um, FDA as an independent agency should be on that list. Uh, steps to make us better able to um, uh, diagnose and respond to, to new infectious disease threats, uh, do it at scale should be on that list. It's going to be a long list, Greg. <laughs> Sure, absolutely. Um, uh, we've got some North Carolina specific questions here. Do you have any specific recommendations for what the state should be doing given the, the COVID numbers in the state right now? Uh, do you think that there's anything the state could improve upon in terms of mandates and protocols? Yeah, I wrote about state actions uh, earlier this week in a Wall Street Journal op-ed with Scott Gottlieb. And uh, there are a lot of states that are taking important steps, starting with mask mandates. That's very important and proven uh, to work and various levels of uh, distancing requirements. I, I don't think the country needs to go back to a full lockdown everywhere uh, because the impact of the disease uh, is different from, from place to place. And North Carolina has tried to have this uh, dial up, dial down approach, uh, which other places are implementing as well. It's one of the questions that, you know, it is true that some parts of the country, uh, El Paso, Texas, um, parts of, um, uh, or much of Michigan, um, uh, California are implementing some, some stricter measures. Uh, those do help. Uh, if you have more spreading in restaurants, if you have more restrictions in bars, uh, gyms, there's no question that spread occurs when people are close together for prolonged periods of time there, um, as well as other places. So these restrictions do help slow the, the spread. And I think we can do them in a regional or statewide uh, dialed approach. Uh, North Carolina, while our trends overall are concerning in terms of, of rising cases, it is not as bad as many parts of the country where we're seeing cases skyrocketing uh, out of control. So hopefully with some uh, limited further 
care measures. And again, attention to um, avoid spreader events over the upcoming Thanksgiving holidays, wearing a mask, keeping a distance. We won't have to go further, but we need to be really vigilant in every part of the country uh, about potentially imposing uh, additional restrictions. Uh, if we do it in a limited and focused way, uh, now or soon, uh, that's what prevents the, the, the need for a broad, more intensive uh, lockdown and all the disruptions that come along with it. We're already seeing reduced uh, economic activity, economic slow, signs of economic slowdown because of the current surge. So measured steps uh, to prevent it from getting, getting worse uh, are the best way to not only uh, contain the, uh, the outbreak, but uh, uh, keep the economy as stabilized as possible. Gotcha. Thank you. I've uh, got a couple of minutes here. I'm going to squeeze in a couple of last questions. Is there anything in particular state should be doing right now to prepare for vaccine distribution? A lot that they should be doing. So every state has been required by the federal government, the Centers for Disease Control, to send in a plan for how they're gonna work with the CDC and the federal government to do distribution. The very first round of distribution in December is mainly gonna be through places like uh, hospitals, healthcare facilities for their own workers uh, and for uh, nursing homes, as I mentioned before. Um, the state needs to make sure that every healthcare organization is thinking about and has a plan for how they're gonna distribute and use the vaccine in their own workers uh, and how they're gonna educate and, and engage them about uh, uh, the benefits and risks and, and why if it's approved by FDA, uh, um, it's, it's likely to be a good decision for them. These are our highest risk um, uh, workers that have been on the front lines and many of them uh, have had to suffer through uh, COVID. Uh, the bigger role for states is really going to come more in January and especially into February and March when we move past this initial very controlled uh, distribution into broader access with more vaccines being available. And there is a lot of work for states to do from that standpoint to engage everybody in all of their uh, communities around uh, the information, clear, accurate information on the vaccines and, and uh, their potential benefits and risks, um, ways to get access to the vaccine conveniently in all neighborhoods and all communities around the state, particularly areas that are, uh, that are typically uh, underserved. That's probably not going to be sufficient just to ask people to go to the doctor, or maybe even the pharmacy, although pharmacies will be a big part of this distribution, probably going to also need special um, uh, pop-up uh, uh, um, uh, administration centers set up. And again, all that needs to be accompanied by good, transparent, clear information. So lots of work ahead for, for the states, for, for all of us uh, uh, to take advantage of the vaccines that are coming. Sure, absolutely. And in our, uh, our dying seconds here before we wrap up, um, obviously two months away is, seems a long way away right now, but is there anything in particular that you would like to see a Biden administration do or say on day one um, that, that isn't being done right now? Well, first, they need to get their transition team integrated with all the people within government, uh, all of these career staff at CDC, at FDA, and all these other agencies that are CMS that are working hard to try to make all of these different pieces of payment and distribution and public education come together. This is not going to be an easy undertaking. And for any big implementation program, you know, I was at CMS for implementing Medicare Part D, which was a big data system change, a big public education um, effort, since this was a voluntary drug benefit. I can't tell you how many uh, specific implementation challenges came up uh, that would really benefit uh, from the kind of interaction that the transition team could have now so they're ready on day one uh, to take further steps to not have any stumbles in on this very important process. The administration is very concerned, current administration, uh, in uh, getting the vaccines out and used effectively. So it's really going to help them uh, to achieve that goal to work closely uh, with, the, uh, with the transition team. And things that I think you'll expect uh, you should expect to see on day one or something more like a, a national plan, uh, not just in vaccines where we kind of have one that's being implemented now, uh, but also more help with uh, distribution and more support, uh, more uh, of a national plan perhaps around the therapeutics that I mentioned, like the monoclonal antibodies, which could really take the edge off uh, uh, the pandemic and save lives now and in the near future if we can work out a, sort of a distribution system and an access system and pay 
payment system for them. Uh, and also, I think some big steps around uh, testing and, and making testing much more widely available and, and uh, with production and, and, and distribution at scale. And then, as you heard from the president-elect already, um, I think a big uh, emphasis of the bully pulpit on doing the things we need to do together to contain the outbreak, uh, mass uh, distancing, um, uh, th those kinds of steps, uh, I think, will help as well. And uh, uh, collaboration with governors and, and state and other state and local officials and carrying this all out. It's, uh, I think that you should expect a pretty big day one set of announcements. Um, and, that, and that's just the administrative things that, that uh, uh, the president-elect and his team would be doing. There also will likely be some legislative proposals around financial relief for businesses that are having to close now because of the spread um, and uh, additional help for schools, for state and local governments, for, for healthcare workers to, to get us through all this as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. McClellan. We've got to call it there, but uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Thank you to Dr. Mark McClellan for sharing your perspective. If you'd like to be notified of upcoming briefings, please email duke news at duke.edu. In the meantime, please stay well, wear a mask, and maybe just